to the Gathering Church. My name is John Mark Redwine, and it's so good to have you guys with us here today. We've been in a series called Summer at the Gathering for a few weeks now, and today is the very last day of Summer at the Gathering. I've declared summer is over. It's finished. We all have to get back to our regularly scheduled lives beginning next week. There will be no more fun, no more sun, no more splashing about all of this nonsense is behind us. Now, I'm just kidding. But our series, Summer, I don't know why, I just wanted to start out a little salty today. So, hope you enjoyed that. If not, there's more on the way. I, um, <clears throat> I, I am so excited about next week. We, we're concluding Summer at the Gathering because next week begins 21 days of prayer for us. And so, if, uh, if you're new to the gathering, twice a year in January and in August, we pause and take a few weeks to dedicate ourselves to prayer. I believe that, that nothing brings the presence of God more clearly, more, more visibly, more felt in our lives than worship and prayer. And so, as a church family, we want to take a couple times a year to really pursue His presence in prayer and in worship. And in January, we do 21 days of prayer and fasting and as a way of really giving God the first part of our year and dedicating this part of, of our year to Him. And in August, we do 21 days of prayer and feasting because it's barbecue season. Come on, somebody. I'm just kidding about the feasting part. In August, we do... Tw that joke didn't land at first service, and I should have learned my lesson. I didn't. And 21 days of prayer in August is really about, about hitting the reset button. I used to have, when I was a kid in the, in the 80s, this, um, this racetrack set, and it had these two cars that would race each other. And halfway through the set, there were these spinning wheels that would make the cars zoom forward again. Anybody know that toy? No? Never mind. It, it, this is like those little spinning... I'm really... Let me just restart. I've done a lot of misfires this morning. <laughs> Good morning, my name is John Mark Redwine, welcome. So 21 Days of Prayer is coming up next week, and here's how it works, here's the flow of it. Uh, Sunday morning we meet here to worship together and meet together, and then Monday through Friday at 6.30 a.m., uh, we will be live online at, at Instagram Live and on uh, live.gatherashville.org. And you can join us there for an opening prayer. It's quick. It's, a, it's, it's, it's like a prompt to prayer that morning. And then we make the commitment together just to, to be in prayer, to start our day off with prayer for, uh, for 21 days together. And then on Saturday, during 21 days of prayer, so uh, beginning a week from Saturday, we will be having prayer services at 9 a.m. at Seacoast Church on Sweeten Creek Road. Listen, if you've never been to one of these services, they're very special. I, I got to encourage you to make time to be there at 9 a.m. on Saturday during 21 days of prayer. We just pray and worship together, and it's a powerful moment where the Spirit moves in powerful ways.
couple ways. And so that is coming up next week. We're also starting a series about prayer. We, we want to resource you in this season of prayer as well. We, we want to be able to come alongside if, if, if prayer has been something that maybe you're getting stale because you've always prayed the same way and you could use some, some new model for prayer, some encouragement for a prayer, or maybe prayer's always been hard for you. Maybe you've always, your prayers have, have been like, uh, you know, you've been great at blessing food and it, you wake up in the morning like, good morning, God. It's, um, hi, it's me. Good, uh, blessing. Amen. And then you kind of move on with your day. If that's you, we want to resource you. Uh, we, we've got a book for you all about prayer with different different kinds of templates for prayer that we're going to put in your hands. And then we're going to teach you different ways to pray over the next four weeks. We're going to start next week by jumping into the deep end of the pool and going with the longest prayer that I pray in my prayer life and uh, that I really believe is going to bless you. And so make sure you're here for that. Don't miss it. I believe that the next thir- 21 days could change your life. It, it, could, it could give you the breakthrough you've been asking for. It could give you an, an opening into the Spirit's work in your life that you haven't been able to see. Don't miss it. Don't miss out on it. It's my favorite thing we do as a church. Don't miss it. This week, we're, doing 20, we're, we're finishing uh, Summer at the Gathering, and we're going to talk about relationships, relationships. And here's, here's my, my opening statement. Anytime we talk about relationships, it could be a hard topic for, for folks in the room who aren't in a relationship, who are just out of one, who are reflecting on it. And I know, I know that it can be frustrating to sit in, in service and listen to a, a, a message for married people. And here's what I would encourage you with. And, and this is just, I believe this to be true. The, the principles that we talk about when we discuss relationship are biblical principles applied to how we should treat people and how we should engage in any kind of a relationship, that you can take it and prepare for the next season of your life. If you're, if you're hoping to be in a relationship one day, I believe that, that if you can learn now how to prepare your heart and what it looks like to be in a good one, that when you get into one, you'll avoid the pain that many of us and maybe you have already been through. And if you're in here and you're one of the students in the room this morning, we got a, some students, they got a little momentum, just got back from camp, feeling good. Here we go, students. Listen, these kinds of messages are the kind that you want to zone out for, that you, you want to, pro, like, instead of thinking about the message, you would rather be thinking about your, you know, I don't know what students think, but your strategy for Fortnite later or something along those lines. And here's what I would encourage you. You deserve better. Than, than what you're willing to accept when you're a teenager. And what we're going to talk about today can apply to every relationship you will have until you are married. And this is what you should strive for, what you should call people up to, and what you should be setting for yourself. So let's lean in. Um, I've titled the message today, Hot Pursuit. Hot Pursuit. I want to tell you a story to get started when Raelle and I met, we were 18 years old. We were kids. We were freshmen in college. I just knew so little about life in general. True story, when Raelle and I met, I still didn't know that you were supposed to wash your sheets regularly. I had no idea. For two years, I had the same sheets on my bed. True story. And as you judge me, let me tell you that for the 18 years up to that, there was the, I never even thought about whether or not I needed to change the sheets. There was always clean ones on the bed. I never even noticed that they were different colors from time to time. And so this is how, how silly, I, how, how young I was when I met my wife and how, how amazing it is that we're together today. The story goes like this. We met our freshman year and we, um, I, I saw her, and it, I, I, was, I was just absolutely enamored with her right away. The moment that I saw her, I, I thought, wow. I thought, this is the girl for me. I thought, that's, that's who I want to spend my life with. I thought, oh my goodness gracious. That's what I thought. We were in a room, and uh, it was a freshman mixer in college. And I saw her walking towards me, and it was like the whole room stopped moving. And I'm thinking, she's walking right at me. And so I'm thinking, come on, man, this is your moment. Get it together. You got, you got, this is, you got to impress her. You've got to woo her in this one statement. Whatever you say had better be good. And she's got pink hair at this time in her life. 
That's a little known fact about Rael. It's not because I say it every time I talk about relationships, but it's important that you remember she had pink hair. And so she's coming towards me, and I'm thinking she's coming right to me. I realize about here that she's planning to walk past me, and so I think even more important to get this right. So she gets right about here, and I say, hey, I really like your hair. It's cool. And I'm thinking in my head, nailed it. (laughs) And she walks past me acting like she doesn't listen. But then she gets right about there and she turns around and she says, listen, if you don't like my hair, you don't have to say anything at all. You don't have to just say something to be nice. And then she just kept walking. (laughs) And I thought, challenge accepted. (laughs) For, For the next three years, I made myself a part of her life. I was there anytime. I, I, would, I would like wait places. I thought she, this is going to sound creepy, and it may be, okay? I would like wait places. I thought she might be so that I could see her. I would just want to hang out with her all the time. We became best friends. We hung out all the time. As much as I could be around her, I was. I had her roommate, was a friend of mine. I had her text me anytime Rail had a guy up in, in, their, in their apartment, and I would go. I would just go. If I, they, I know, I know. I would just, <laughs> if, if she said, hey, some, so-and-so is here, I'd be like, I'm on my way. And I would come, and I would just hang out. <laughs> Didn't bother me one bit. I was there. And I, honestly, during this time, we just, we just learned to laugh together. We became friends. It was so good. And uh, I became a follower of Jesus three years after we met. And once I became a Christian, I finally had the confidence to say, this is the person I want to spend my life with. And I began to pursue her. And I, and I began to just, I told her how I felt about her. And, I, and I, I just did everything that I could to make her want to be with me. I went after her. I brought flowers every time I saw her. I did not see her without a flower in hand. I planned every date that we had was elaborate, thought out, expensive. I blew the bank on this woman. I'm still paying for it. Just kidding. Finished last year. And so (laughs) I, I, I made sure that she felt seen valued and wanted every single day. We were long distance, and in that season, we spoke on the phone for at least two hours every day. One time, we had a 10-hour phone conversation. Barf, am I right? Who would do that? I, I made her feel wanted with everything that I could. I needed her to know the amount of value that I saw in her. After uh, five years of knowing each other, we got married, and she said yes. I couldn't believe it. I saved up for that ring. I, 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 I wouldn't eat anything but chicken nuggets and mac and cheese for three months saving for that ring, but all of you guys know that that's what I was eating anyways, so I wasn't really spending money off, but, but I'm telling you, I went after her as hard as I could, and she said yes, and we got married and then, and then I thought to my, myself, mission accomplished. And things began to shift, and they began to change. And six years later, we had moved here to Asheville to start a brand new church. We had an eight-week-old baby. And I gave every ounce of that attention, that drive, that persistence, that energy that I used in pursuing her to, to starting this church. I gave it everything that I had. And I gave her nothing. I would, I would go to work and plan and strategize, and meet people and meet with people all day and come home and Rael with a new baby, starving to hear about this church we moved here together to start, would ask me how it went. And I would say, I don't want to talk right now. I'm tired. Turn on the TV and watch the TV for the rest of the night. And after a year of this, our marriage began to feel hollow. Like there was this meat inside, this heart inside that was gone now, like something was missing. And that was when we admitted we needed help. We began to go to counseling. Can I pause in the story right here for a moment to say admitting that you're in trouble and you need help is a sign of strength, not a sign of weakness. Many of us were raised to believe that admitting to someone outside of yourself is is a sign of weakness. I need you to hear me say it is not. 
Because every single person in this room will find themselves at some point in life facing something that is beyond them to fix. And it is okay to ask for help. We asked for help. And we went to counseling. And I was pretty sure that when we went to counseling, they were going to fix her so our marriage could get back on track. And I was very surprised when for the first month, all we talked about was me. And we went for six months, often, And what we learned in that season was that somewhere over the last six years, I had stopped pursuing my wife, and it had cost us. Maybe you've been in a similar situation. Maybe maybe it was was, uh, when you were dating, you would move heaven and earth for this person. You would lie on the phone at night just listening to each other breathe, and, and you hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. I'm not saying goodbye. No, I'm not barf. Am I right? Gross. How, who does that, right? It, it, maybe it, you, you would, you sold, you, you spent your whole savings to buy tickets to a concert for a band that you hate because it's their favorite, right? Maybe you moved heaven and earth to get together with this person, but then you got them and you got in that relationship and you hit some milestone. Maybe it was, they said yes to dating. Maybe you got engaged. Maybe you got married. Maybe it was that first child when suddenly your attention has to focus somewhere else and you never remembered to bring it back to the person you fell in love with in the first place. And either way, You're in a place now where it just feels like something is missing. And we just wonder what happened. There was a time when you would move anything just to be close to them. And and now you won't move yourself out of the way if they want to pass by you in the kitchen. You're like, no, you just wait. I'll be done with this in a minute, you know. I do that all the time. That's why I said that. And as a result of this... Our intimacy weakens, and our relationship begins to leak, and it leaks kindness, and it leaks patience, and it leaks proximity, and it leaks love. What I believe about relationships and what we've learned, what we're learning, is that relationship requires pursuit. Relationship requires pursuit pursuit at every stage, at every phase, as long as there is breath in your lungs, relationship requires pursuit. A few different kinds of pursuit. First, it requires mutual pursuit. Mutual pursuits. A healthy relationship means each person should be pursuing the other. I think a lot of times there is a natural pursuer and a natural pursuee in a relationship. One of us had to be won over. One of us had to be convinced. One of us was persistent, and one eventually gave in. And that's okay, but for a long-term relationship like marriage, it cannot just be one side or the other. Or sometimes we're both pursuers, but never at the same time. In one season, you'll be pursuing. In one season, they'll be pursuing. And for the other person, it always just feels frustrating that it was a missed season. There's a passage in Ephesians about marriage that I absolutely love. It goes like this, and I I wrote it wrong on the screen. It's 521. Ephesians 521. It precedes Ephesians 522. If you grew up in church like I did, there is a chance that you've heard Ephesians 5 preached in the context of marriage. And a lot of times when a preacher like me starts teaching Ephesians 5 in the context of marriage, we'll start with Ephesians 5.22, which says, Wives, submit to your husbands. And there's usually kind of a lot of twang and a podium, and it's like, Wives, submit to your husbands. Thank you, Jay. My man. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so I, I want you to hear this morning... That there is a verse before that one that changes the whole game. Ephesians 5.21 says, Submit to one another out of reference for Christ. Submit to one another. And then it says, Wives, submit to your husbands. And then it says, Husbands, love your wives the way Christ loved the church. Sacrifice for her the way he sacrificed 
for the church. It's a cycle of mutual pursuits. I sacrifice for you. You sacrifice for me. We submit to one another. We give for one another. If you are in a relationship and, and all you do is pursue, 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 and is never reciprocated, it begins to feel difficult to continue. And it's time to start asking some questions. And if you're in a relationship and you're used to being pursued and to being pursued and when something's not right, your instinct is, why haven't they done anything for me in a while? But you've never done anything for them. It's time to evaluate the relationship. Relationship requires mutual pursuit and it requires intentional pursuit. Intentional pursuit. There's a great story of romantic pursuit in the Bible uh, that I want to share with us. And I think we can learn a lot about relationships from this story. Now, honestly, the Bible is full of a lot of what not to do in the context of marriage. One of the things that I think is so wonderful about the Bible is it never shies away from the flaws of humanity, that it, it kind of paints the whole picture. It's a constant contrast between the flaws of people and the perfection of God. That is the whole point of everything that Jesus did was to combine those two things. And I love that about the scriptures. But there is a story that I love and I think we can learn from. But we're going to have to push back past two things that are, that are, that are going to distract you, okay? This is a story of a man named Jacob pursuing a woman named Rachel and it does involve a little bit of incest and a little bit of polygamy. And I just need you to not think about that right now. I need you to move. It's, listen, this is thousands of years ago. It was a different time. To, to, it was actually better to go. They, they thought it was better to date someone who was related to you in some way. I don't know why. They, this was what they thought. And then, and then that was kind of the cultural thing. Polygamy, it was still a big deal to God, but in the context. So let's just not think about those things. And here's what I want you to learn. Jacob was out on his own for the first time. And he meets this woman named Rachel, and he falls head over heels in love with her. He sees her, and he's just hard eyes. Like, all he can think about is this woman. And so he goes to her father, Laban, and says, I would love to marry Rachel. Give me her hand in marriage. And Laban says, well, we're related, so that's good. That's a plus for you. And then he, and then he says, I will allow you to marry my daughter on the condition that you work for me for seven years first. And that sounds a little bit harsh, but all the dads in the room who have daughters are like, actually, that's not such a bad idea. <laughs> kinda, I'm kind of for that. And the Bible says, Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Isn't that romantic? Come on. That's good writing. Right? That's some, is, isn't that? Okay, and so... They get to the end of the seven years, and Laban pulls the old switcheroo. So there's a lot of veils and sheets and curtains involved in the whole wedding ceremony in this culture. And so basically, it's two days after the wedding, and Jacob realizes he's married Leah, Rachel's sister, and not Rachel. Laban says, yep, sorry about that, pulled the old switcheroo on you, but this is our custom for the older daughter to marry before the younger daughter. And he says, I will also give you Rachel's hand in marriage if you work for me for another seven years. And so Jacob says, absolutely yes. Now what happens next really matters. Here's what you should know about Jacob. Pretty much everything he's gotten so far in his life, he's gotten through deception and trickery. It is not outside of his character to say yes to this, marry the girl, and run away. So two weeks after he marries Leah, he marries Rachel on this condition. And for the next seven years, Jacob works for her like he doesn't have her yet. Here's what I want us to see. This man married Rachel, but continued to work 
like he did not have her yet. And that's what intentional pursuit is. See, I just think so often we get married or we get to that milestone in a relationship and we stop the work because we think I've got what I wanted. It's here. I'm done. I don't have to keep working as hard as I worked before. But if we can learn from this moment in Jacob's life where for once he said, I'm going to keep working because this is of greater value to me than any other thing I've gotten so far. Because this is so important that I'm not just going to say I got her, it's done, and go away and live my life. I'm going to stay here and keep working like I don't have her yet. Intentional pursuit. I think a lot of times we treat our, our relationship like this when we know we can't live this way in other areas of our life. Imagine if you went to the gym and, and you spent two years trying to get to a fitness goal and you got where you wanted to be and you stepped on the scale and you hit that goal and you said, all right, I did it, I'm good, and you stopped going to the gym and you went back to eating the way that you did before and you just quit all of it because you hit the goal you were after. It would take you two weeks to get back to where you were before two years prior. Or imagine if you got a, a promotion at work that you had worked so hard to get to. <clears throat> and you go into the workplace after getting that promotion and decide to take it easy because you got what you were working for. Getting married and then stopping your pursuit is like mowing the grass once and then selling the mower because, hey, it's done. Doesn't it look good? You know, Listen, this is the mountains. That grass is going to look bad again on Wednesday if you're not doing some maintenance on it today. I know that's true because my wife told me she cuts all the grass in our marriage. She would want me to tell you that. It's important. Here's the thing. The first service laughed at that. They thought that was funny. Here's the thing. Uh, your pursuit has to be intentional and ongoing. It can't just be something that we stop, that, that we reach one point and we say this is enough. A healthy relationship requires pursuit that is mutual that is intentional, and it requires godly pursuit. Godly pursuit. The pursuit of God. I believe that the pursuit of God is a crucial part of a healthy relationship, both individually and together. Because as you pursue God, you will grow closer to Him, and He will come closer to you, and as a result, who you are will more closely reflect Him. Your marriage will begin to more closely reflect his design for it. It'll become easier for you to have patience and peace and kindness and gentleness and self-control. These are the things that we call the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians 5, Paul talks about the, the wonderful things that will grow and develop in us as we grow the Holy Spirit in our lives and invite his presence into more areas of our life. And as we spend more time with God, we'll begin to grow this peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. And I think it's so interesting that what we call the fruits of the Spirit are the very thing that most of our, many of our marriages are in deficit of. We lack patience for one another. We lack self-control in what we say. We don't have the same kindness for our spouse that we do for strangers that we meet. And the closer we get to God, the more these things begin to grow inside of us, the better our marriages will become. Jesus was giving the Sermon on the Mount, and in Matthew 6, he's talking about all the things that give people anxiety and stress and worry. And he's talking about all the things that we work for and need, and he encourages the crowd that God knows that they need these things, and so instead of only focusing on our needs, we should focus on pursuing God first, and he will provide from there. It says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you as well. If we just put that relational verse into a microscope, and we think about our marriage, if you would just pursue God first, do it on your own and do it as a couple. Pursue God and you will grow closer together. He will provide. You will become more and more of the spouse you were meant to be so that your marriage could look more like the picture he intended. Relationship requires pursuit. So let's talk a little bit before we go this morning about what this looks like. 
Let's, let's close the gap between our intentions and our actions. I think sometimes we can hear a message like this and go home and think, that was a great message about relationships, and plop down on the couch, and the baby starts crying, and you go, hey, baby's calling for you, you know, and then they're like, no, it's your turn, and then you're just arguing already, and so what I want to do is give you some practical stuff that we can take home today to close this gap between our intentions and our, and our actions. So three things. First is when you think something good, say it. When you think something good, say it. So simple. Just words. I'm so bad at this. I'll see my wife walk across the room and think she is so elegantly beautiful. And I'll just think it. Or I'll come home after a long day at work and the house is spotless and there's laundry folded up on the bed and she's busy making dinner and the children are still breathing. And I'll be like, wow, she worked really hard today. And I'll say, hey, babe, it's a long day. I'm going to go sit down. <laughs> I'm so bad at this. And here's the thing. The more that we say stuff like this out loud, the closer we become to one another, and the more we begin to think these things, and the more we say them out loud, the closer we become to one another, and the more we want to say these things, and it's just a cycle that builds and builds and gets easier as you go until it becomes almost a second nature where when you think something good, your, body, your brain knows this should go to the mouth. This should come out. I shouldn't just think it. It says in Hebrews 3.13, but encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Let's apply that to marriage. Encourage one another every single day so that you won't be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Do you, do you know what the writer means by sin's deceitfulness? Do you recognize those lies? I work so hard on this house. I spent the last two weeks doing a project every night, spent all weekend on it, and it's like they don't even notice. I don't even think they care. Or I, I spent the last six months going to the gym four days a week, and I've seen results, but they haven't said a word about it. Do they even care? Do they even notice me anymore? I dressed up for them tonight, and they didn't even say a word. Do they still think I'm attractive? Or I think I'm the only one that, that does anything around here because I, I work and I work and I work and they never say a single word of appreciation. I did enough laundry for 30 people in the last five days somehow for these three people and not a single one of them said thank you. And I don't think they even care about your sins, deceitfulness. See, when we don't say the things that we're thinking, it allows this stuff to sink in and for us to start to believe it is true, and it drives a wedge in our relationships. Here's a couple specifics. Pursue, men, pursue her with words of affection. Pursue her with words of affection. And hear this, guys, non-sexual affection. Listen, this is hard. And I learned when we were in counseling back in December, this past December, that I'm really bad at that. <laughs> I'm just now learning after eight years of marriage that I was able to give any compliment in a way that was sexual in nature. This is a gift guys have because we can make anything sound that way. You can say, you know, hey, I need you to get the tires rotated. And we're like, well, I'm going to rotate your tires, baby. <laughs> need to get the oil changed. I'm going to change that oil for you, baby. Don't you worry. Oh God, we'll get it. We'll get it done. All right. It's like a gift and a curse, am I right? And if that's all you're ever saying, they're going to think that that's all you see in them. See, what I'm learning about me and about my wife and our marriage is she needs to hear that I value her for something other than that. Pursue her with words of affection that are not sexual in nature. Say, I love you every single day, but add because, and change the ending every time. I love you because you are so self-sacrificing for our family. I love you because the way that you work teaches me how to work. I love you because you have so much fun being silly with our kids. I love you because sometimes you do it when it's not fun being silly with our kids. 
I love you because of the way you make me feel better than I make myself feel. I love you because of the way you see me and it makes me want to be that person. I love you because you made my favorite dessert for my birthday. (laughs) Strawberry shortcake. I forgot y'all were here for a minute. (laughs) Say I love you every day. Say because. Change the ending. Give them something to feel valued in. If you think something good, say it. Men pursue her with words of affection. Women pursue him with words of affirmation. Words of affirmation. There's a book called Love and Respect uh, by Emerson Egrix, and it's all about the different things men and women need from each other. And there's been all these studies that show what men need is affirmation, to know what she sees in him, to know that she is proud of him, to know that she believes in him. Ladies, he is becoming what you see in him. Don't tell him what he is not. Tell him what you see him becoming. Don't call out his crap more often than you call up his potential. It's okay to call us out. Somebody's got to do it. But make sure that the scales tip in favor of how often you speak life. Ephesians 4.29 says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. In your marriage, your words, when they are negative, can tear one another down in a unique way. We have access to tear one another down that nobody else has access to. But we also have a greater ability to build each other up than anybody else. Your words matter. If you think something good, say it. Men, she wants to know, do you love me today and why? And ladies, he wants to know, do you believe in me today and why? Second, when you think of something special, do it. When you think of something special, do it. It says in James 4, 17, if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it's sin for them. If you think of some way to serve your spouse, do it. This passage is written to the church as a whole, to everybody and how we should treat people. But the illustration used over and over again for Jesus and the church is a bride and a groom. I think it's safe to say he wants our marriages to reflect the relational expectation he has for us as the church. In other words, when you think of something special, do it. Do it. Do things for one another. I can't tell you how often I think of something I could do for my wife that I know she would love, but I just don't get around to it. What could be more important? If you think about grabbing flowers, grab flowers. When we were dating, I never saw her without flowers in my hand. Can't afford to do that anymore. We have kids now. But that doesn't mean that I can't show up with flowers more often than not. If you, if you think of something that you know they love, maybe it means just the, a matter of letting them watch a cooking show one night instead of a Marvel movie. That's a big one in our relationship. Maybe it means you drove her car and you're going to fill it up with gas before you return it, even if it's already half a tank. Just go ahead and top it off. It's thoughtfulness. It's just doing little things that make them see, feel seen and valued and wanted. Grab takeout on your way home and say, hey, I'm getting takeout. We're not cooking tonight. We're going for a picnic at the park and value them. Write a little note. Leave it on the sink. The key to this is do something that your spouse would want, not something that you would want. The key to thoughtfulness is learning to think the way that they think instead of the way that you think and meet them in that place. The last thing is this. If you want something different, be it. If you want something different, be it. It's got to start with you. There's so many different scenarios and avenues that we find ourselves in in relationships, but there's a pattern these days. It goes like this. You meet someone and you fall in love and you pursue them passionately and you get married and you stop pursuing. And after five to seven years, it doesn't feel the same. There's no affection, no intimacy, no connection. 
So at some point, you decide you want something different. And you either pursue it in private or you talk about it and the marriage ends and you go looking for something else. If you're somewhere in this pattern, I would encourage you that if you want something different, be it. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Here's the difference, and here's what this passage means. When we feel like something's wrong, something's missing, it's not as much fun as it used to be, it's not as exciting as it used to be, we mourn it, and then we just, we stay in that place. Worldly sorrow is a sorrow that says, woe is me, life's not what I want it to be, it's not as good as I want it to be, things didn't work out the way that I want them to do, and, and then we just keep pursuing what we think we want, and it allows everything good in our lives to begin to wither. Godly sorrow is different from that. Godly sorrow looks at any area of our lives, anything that feels wrong, that feels off, that feels missing, that feels broken, and says, this, this doesn't feel right. I wonder what God can do to redeem it. I wonder what God can do to fix it. Godly sorrow leads to repentance, which doesn't leave regret. It doesn't mean you don't wish that things happened that, that could, could go away. It doesn't mean that you don't have things you could regret. It means that God's going to make something new in your life. Repentance is just a word that means to turn back, to turn back, to turn back, turn back to pursuit, to turn back to the way that it was before, to change who you are so that some change might start to grow in your relationship. If you're in your marriage still, but you feel disconnected and lonely and you want out, I would encourage you to turn your sorrow and your sadness and your frustration and your emptiness over to God and let it lead you to turn back, to change back to the way things were meant to be, to turn back to pursuit, which grows intimacy, which fuels love, which makes your marriage what you wanted it to be again. And it just depends on where you are on this spectrum. If you're up in the, in the early stage, you're you're the one I came to talk to today because I've been there. I mean, just praise God that when we were here in this stage where it just didn't feel right, something was wrong, something was missing, we allowed it to be a godly sorrow. It turned us to repentance, to go say, I need help. Maybe you're in a place where you need to admit, I need help. I need somebody else to speak into my marriage. I need tools to get back on track. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do it. We can help you with that. We can. I'm not a counselor. I give the worst advice you've ever heard. But we can connect you with somebody who can help. We would love to do that. Maybe it's early enough where you haven't quite felt like something's broken yet, but you do feel that something's missing. Pursue. Have some hard conversations. Begin to pursue one another again. Just act like you're dating. Act like you've got no sense in the world. Like you just, just want to be around each other. Refresh your relationship with pursuit. When you think something good, say it. When you think something special, do it. Go after one another. Give each other time. Be thoughtful. Learn what they value. And then give them as much of it as you can. And if you're in the phase of your relationship where it's too late in some form, maybe it's ended, and you're hearing this message and you're feeling shame and you're thinking of all the things that you should have done differently that you wish they would have done differently, I need you to hear that there's no room in the gospel for shame. And that's not who our God is. In fact, I love this verse so, so much because it says godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. Leaves no regret. It means let's change and move forward. That in the next relationship, let's never stop pursuing. Let's have conversations on the front end. 
Here's my expectation. Here's what we need. Here's how this is different from the last time. Here's how this succeeds in a new way, in a different way. Relationship requires pursuit. Relationship requires pursuit. To get what you once had, you must do what you once did. Jesus saying to the church, in Revelations 2, 5, he speaks to the church and says, remember the height from which you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. Return to the way that it was in the beginning. Remember, he's talking to the church and talking about how when we first meet Jesus, how excited we are to be in that relationship. And when you meet your spouse, when you meet your you, when you meet the person you're in a relationship with, there's so much excitement and chemistry and all of it's going on. And Man, I just believe the encouragement for you would be to just turn back, look at the way that it was, and pursue that again. Relationship requires pursuit. Pursue one another. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are, God. And just for the way that you've taught us to treat each other, to treat one another, God, every every. Every command that you've given us about how to fight against everything inside of us that is wrong, that has fallen, and to treat each other with love and respect and, and kindness and patience, Father. Help us to turn all of that into the context of our marriage today, God. I've been, sometimes I've been really good at treating people well while still treating my family not well. And I repent of that. And I just ask, Father, that for every person in this room who's in, this, in a relationship, God, that, that you would just turn their hearts towards pursuit for one another, that they would keep working, that we would keep working like we're not there yet. Father, we just lay it at your feet. Be glorified in our relationships. Help us to, to, to get closer to you so that we would become more like you so our relationships would look more like you designed. We just love you, Father. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.